Each year, the Buffalo Zoo welcomes more than 350,000 visitors, making it the most visited cultural attraction in western New York. Naturalistic exhibits, the staff's dedication to conservation, the remarkable animal collection, and of course the support of visitors like you, all make the zoo the success it is today. Once you've been to the Buffalo Zoo, you can also see that it is rich in history and tradition. I'm Donna Fernandez, President and CEO of the Buffalo Zoo, and I'm here to take you on a historical tour of the third oldest zoo in the country. Join me as we learn about the zoo's beginnings, its struggles during the Great Depression and World Wars, and the many changes at the zoo over the last 130 years. The Buffalo Zoo's story begins more than a century ago, when Jacob Berchtold, the owner of a fashionable fur and hat shop on Delaware Avenue, received a pair of live deer in 1870. Since he had no idea how to care for them, Mr. Berchtold donated the deer to the city of Buffalo. Thanks to Ellen Jewett, the publisher of the Buffalo Daily Journal, the deer were housed on his estate on the corner of Jewett and Parkside Avenues. By this time, plans were underway for a park to be constructed in the area to give city residents a place to stroll and socialize. The park, designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, soon became a favorite spot for many families. By 1875, the number of deer had grown to five, and a building was constructed to protect them and to provide an office for the park superintendent. The Buffalo Zoo was born. Over the next 15 years, a pair of bison, eight elk, and many deer were added. Due to the ever-increasing animal collection, knowledgeable management in the care of the animals was required. The Buffalo Zoo hired its first curator, Mr. Frank Thompson, in 1895. Under Mr. Thompson's direction, stone bear pits designed to replicate old Roman ruins were completed in 1897. Visitors were delighted with the new exhibit and were able to view the bears from a raised sidewalk that protected them from carriage traffic. In 1898, Dr. Francis Crandall was hired as the new curator. Plans to hold the 1901 Pan American Expo in Delaware Park renewed interest in making the park the most exciting show place in Buffalo. An outdoor aviary was added, along with a pool for two sea lions, donated by Mr. Frank Goodyear. Mr. Goodyear also donated Big Frank, a six-year-old Indian elephant. Other animals on exhibit during this period included badgers, bears, fox, moose, raccoons, wolves, and woodchucks. In 1912, the Elephant House, which is still in use today, was completed. The start of World War I strained funding for the zoo, but the public continued to enjoy visiting. When the war ended in 1918, more people were in favor of supporting domestic needs, so it was suggested that $1 million be set aside to revitalize the zoo. By 1929, however, it was evident that no city funding improvements had been made for over 17 years. Area citizens began suggesting the formation of a zoological society to raise both funds and interest for the zoo, since this had proven to be successful in other cities. In 1931, the Zoological Society, under the leadership of Stuart Goldberg, was incorporated. By 1935, the future of the Buffalo Zoo seemed brighter thanks to the Works Progress Administration, a program created by Franklin Roosevelt to employ people suffering from the Great Depression. The zoo's construction projects, estimated to cost more than $2 million, included new walkways, as well as a lion house, reptile house, bird house, and monkey island. Upon curator Frank Crandall's retirement, Marlon Perkins was hired. The Buffalo Zoo's animal collection became one of the best in the country under Perkins' care. Visitors were delighted as Eddie, a young chimpanzee, performed shows twice a day. Not to be outdone, three California sea lions mastered their own tricks, while the monkeys on Monkey Island chased each other about. In 1942, the zoo's new reptile house, which housed more than 400 specimens, was said to be the finest in the country. World War II, however, had a negative effect on the zoo as food became scarce. The people of Buffalo came to the rescue by planting vegetables in a garden on zoo ground. Despite a thriving animal collection and meeting the challenges brought on by the war, Curator Perkins resigned in 1944 due to concerns that zoo funds were still scarce. While financial strains limited the zoo's growth over the next 20 years, the city attempted to move forward. Revenues were generated through the addition of a train ride and concession stands in the early 1950s. Generous donations from the public resulted in a large variety of animals being housed at the Buffalo Zoo. The additions of gorillas Samson and Jonesy helped to draw in more visitors. 
1965, the Buffalo Rotary Club donated $40,000 for the construction of a children's zoo. The addition featured a talking bird, ducks, monkeys, ponies, pygmy donkeys, goats, sheep, and a giant tortoise. This marked another milestone for the zoo as attendance soared to more than one million visitors. In 1967, Peter Andrews of the Zoological Society donated funds for a giraffe house and an animal hospital, the first set of large buildings to be completed in 30 years. In 1973, operation of the zoo was transferred from the city of Buffalo to the Zoological Society. It was during this time that an admission fee was introduced to generate more revenue. Volunteers also played a key role in the operation of the zoo, and the docent organization was founded. To this day, we continue to have the highest regard for our docents, who generously donate their time to lead tours, assist with programs, and provide interpretation to our visitors. As knowledge about animal behavior increased, it was recognized that more modernization was needed at the zoo. A plan was developed under zoo director J. Thomas Whitman to make the exhibits more naturalistic, to focus on reproduction of endangered species, and to enhance educational programming. The plan came to a halt during the blizzard of 1977 when the zoo suffered over $420,000 in damages. Zoo staff were forced to round up some reindeer who had escaped over a snow-filled moat, along with some bison who climbed over their exhibit fence. On top of this, the county reduced the zoo's operating funds by 15%. Planning continued despite the financial burdens, and in November of that year, an African savanna exhibit was ready for three black rhinos. A month later, a baby rhino was born. In 1980, a new entrance and service center were added, with snack bar, first aid station, washrooms, and gift shop. A new gorilla exhibit opened in 1981, followed by a gunite mountain for bighorn sheep, and a prairie dog exhibit in the old sea lion pool. During the 1980s and 1990s, the zoo's mission began to change as the number of animals in collection was reduced. By doing this, the zoo was better able to focus on the breeding of rare and endangered species that might not otherwise have a chance at survival. A notable success for the zoo was the opening of the Children's Resource Center in 1984. The CRC now houses the Education Department and the Dr. Charles Drew Science Magnet School. In 1988, the lion and tiger exhibit Habitat opened to the public. The 1990s began with the completion of the Parkside entrance and Zootique in 1992. Other projects included the Hyena exhibit, the Diversity of Life hallway, the Elephant Yard expansion, and renovation of the Children's Zoo. A presentation area called the Wild Place was also created to enable children to see and touch large animals, including elephants. To help visitors get up close and personal with their animals, a giraffe feeding station was added in 2000. Lorikeet Landing, an outdoor aviary reminiscent of the Australian Outback, opened in 2001, which gave visitors the opportunity to feed nectar to these colorful creatures. In 2002, an exciting new master plan was unveiled to completely transform the zoo over the next 15 years. The major organizing theme of the plan is water. This theme was chosen because of water's historic importance to the city of Buffalo. Situated between two great lakes and at the foot of Erie Canal, Buffalo is world-renowned for the use of water for hydroelectric power, transportation, and recreation. The new zoo exhibits will include rivers, streams, watering holes, and waterfalls, and replicate different habitats from around the world. The Vanishing Animals exhibit was the first to open under the new plan, consisting of six large naturalistic enclosures for threatened and endangered species. This was followed closely by the opening of Eco Station, a mock field camp overlooking three indoor habitats featuring the latest in research equipment used by conservation biologists. Kids can also experience the life of a scientist in our new Bone Zone, completed in 2002, where they can dig for dinosaur fossils along with other budding paleontologists. Otter Creek was the third major exhibit to open under the new master plan. Modeled after Letchworth State Park, the exhibit features a waterfall, naturalistic rockwork, and underwater viewing of the river otters as they swim and play. In response to the public's request for the return of California sea lions, Sea Lion Cove opened in the summer of 2005. Sea Lion Cove features rockwork resembling that found in the native California coastal habitat. Visitors can view the sea lions above and below the water or enjoy a keeper demonstration in the outdoor amphitheater. Transformation of the zoo will take many years and a lot of patience, but we are sure the results will be worth the wait. 
Future projects include a South American rainforest, a new entry plaza, an Arctic realm, an African watering hole, and a new children's zoo. Well, that brings us back to the future. As you learned on our tour, the Buffalo Zoo is full of history, and much of what you see today is due to visitors like you. We hope you'll continue to monitor our progress and look forward to sharing our exciting future with you.